Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Susan Chirk, who is director of the University of California System-Wide Institute on Global Conflict and Cooperation and professor of political science at UC San Diego. During 1997 to 2000, Professor Shirk served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of East Asia and Pacific Affairs with responsibility for China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Mongolia. She first traveled to China in 1971 and has been doing research there ever since. Her new book is China, Fragile Superpower. Susan, welcome back to Berkeley. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. What was your goal in writing this book? Well, my goal was to uh, open up the black box of Chinese domestic politics, Chinese domestic situations, so that people could understand better how Americans should think about China and handle the rise of China. How long did it take you to write the book? Well, I came back from Washington uh, in 2000 and started doing research and then it took about two years to actually write it. You are a, a prominent uh, China scholar mm -hmm. and uh, who, who did service in Washington so I'm, I'm curious about how uh, your perspective has changed first as a scholar traveling regularly China but then on the other hand as a as a policy uh, person who, who could have uh, an impact uh, on China. How, w w were these different perspectives you were blessed to have? Or? Sure, I feel very fortunate. I mean, not that many scholars have this rare opportunity to actually participate and maybe even a little bit influence history, not just studying it. Um, and I really enjoyed the action-oriented, uh, you know, role as a policymaker. There is, being a scholar, as you know, especially the research and writing, is kind of a lonely monk enterprise. Mm -hmm. You have to do a lot of it by yourself. And it was very exciting to be engaged with Madeleine Albright and President Clinton and other people who were really trying to make progress in laying a foundation for better relations with China during that period. And remember, this is right after 1996, which was a time that we actually came into an eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball confrontation with China. And so when I came to Washington, I and other members of the administration were really worried about the possibility of a military conflict with China. So it was very exciting. And, and uh, I'm curious, was there, because there, w w in, in the literatures there's always this discussion of theory and practice, so I'm, I'm curious, mm -hmm. is what surprised you most when you switched hats from scholar to policymaker in a general way? Did anything surprise you? or? Well, it didn't intellectually surprised me. Uh, I didn't learn a whole lot more about China, I have to say. One reason I went into government is I thought, oh, I'm going to have access to all this intelligence. Mm -hmm. I'm actually really going to understand how it works there, you know? And I, it was pretty disappointing, I have to tell you. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel I learned that much more from the intelligence that I'd learned as an academic interviewing and visiting China all that time. And then, of course, what you get a very heavy dose of is the politics in Washington. Mm -hmm. And this is the Clinton administration, so there was a lot of uh, talk about the Clinton administration campaign contributions from Chinese and uh, you know giving away nuclear secrets to China, all sorts of mostly partisan attacks that actually had no foundation. Mm -hmm. So let's talk, well, well, later we'll talk about U.S.-China relations, but now I, I want to just sort of focus on how things have changed in China, because your first trips were in the early 70s, and mm -hmm. China was rural, uh, undeveloped, 
But uh, we, in our first interview, we discussed that you had this rare opportunity to, to meet with uh, Joanne Lai the, mm -hmm. the first time you were there. So uh, give us a sense of how you've watched China change over the years that you've been doing research there. Well, uh, when I first went to China in 1971, it was still the Cultural Revolution. Everybody was in baggy navy and khaki clothing, wearing Mao badges. Um, almost no automobiles, people just riding bicycles. It was, it was and things were decrepit, uh, rusting uh, railings in parks, and nobody mowed the lawn, and uh, there was nothing to buy in the stores at all. You know, and I'm, I'm a big shopper. Mm -hmm. All I could get was a khaki bag saying, Ray, uh, Wei Renmin Fu Wu, serve the people. <laughs> you know, it was, I mean, it was fascinating and very exciting, but it was really decrepit. Um, and the contrast between Hong Kong and the mainland was very vivid, because Hong Kong was a dynamic, modern place. You know, now I go to North Korea sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, because when I go from Beijing to North Korea, hmm. It's a little bit like 71 going from Hong Kong mm. to mainland China, to Beijing. Mm -hmm. you know, um, although then the gap was even bigger than the gap to North Korea now. So of course, you know, China has become a very dynamic market economy, uh, very modern. All the uh, Western stores are basically there, the designers fancy, wealthy people with Mercedes and, you know, so it's, it's really like night and day. And I feel very fortunate to have seen this dramatic transformation. But behind all that development mm -hmm. is sort of the political China. You know, sometimes when I give a talk, I talk about the economic China and the political China. Mm -hmm. Political China is still uh, not that changed. Mm -hmm. and, and let's talk about that in a second, but I'm going uh, to lift out uh, from your book a wealth of statistics to give our audience kind of an, the, the sense of, of the impact of these mm -hmm. economic changes, uh, uh, which uh, your book does a wonderful job of doing. The volume of trade has increased 25 times from 1978 to 2001. Uh, during 1978 to 2004, China's GDP grew at an average annual rate of 9.5. Uh, China's per capita income grew at 8%. Uh, percent. Uh, people over 60, you say 128 million people in 2000, but in 2030 there will be 350 million. Uh, uh, 20 more years of rapid growth would quadruple the size of the economy, economy with per capita income at 3,000. And then uh, when you're talking about that last statistic, you quote Huntington, who warns us that the, the change from $1,000 to 3,000 is, is potentially a, a very uh, revolutionary violent period for any society. Well, what's interesting is the Chinese have read Huntington, too. <laughs> the leaders, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and, that's, and they, I mean, they quote that all the time. Yeah. So they see this as a dangerous strait to cross as well. Yeah, and uh, 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 you, you, you focus in your book, as you get into the black box, you really get in to the politics of China, which you were just touching on. Let's talk a little about that, because I think your book really points to a number of contradictions mm -hmm. uh, in, in Chinese uh, uh, societies. T talk a little bit. It's really about the party not wanting to change. Is that correct? Well, the party wants to stay in power. Yeah. I think the party would be willing to change, would be willing to do anything mm -hmm. to stay in power. That's, they've got a very clear focus there. And that's because in 1989, the Tiananmen protests, mm -hmm. uh, in pro-democracy protests in more than a thir 130 cities, uh, the leadership split, the regime only survived by the skin of their teeth. Mm -hmm. Same year, the Berlin Wall falls. Mm -hmm. And communism starts to topple in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. So, of course, uh, the China's leaders feel that their own days are numbered. And so they're struggling to 
prolong their lifespan. And then they look around them. They just, all they have to do is look out the window mm -hmm. and see what we were just talking about, how China has changed. Mm -hmm. And so how do they maintain control? How do they maintain power? in a vibrant market economy that's so open to the world, in which people are moving all over China. They don't have the same control over the population they used to. People don't work in state enterprises. So they're, uh, they're very worried and insecure. Mm -hmm. you know, just about that movement of people that you, you cite in your book is this number, 130 million rural dwellers have emigrated to the cities. That's half of the U.S. population. Right. So, so the, these numbers and, and the, the changes potentially they could lead to are just quite, uh, quite extraordinary. Yeah, this is really a historic exodus of people from the rural areas to the cities and you know, it's a very dramatic tr modernization and transformation of society. And, and the Chinese uh, always are embedded not just in their recent history. So when you're talking about volatile situations, mm -hmm. they know that some of the most important moments in modern Chinese history have brought governments down, really. Uh, the May well, 4th movement, the, and so on. Right, um, and they're you know, uh, this brings us to the question of nationalism because mm -hmm. they are very aware mm -hmm. that the previous two dynasties, the Qing dynasty, which fell in 1911 to the Republic of China and the Republic of China, which was defeated by the communists in 1949, both of those dynasties were toppled by these national movements in which the specific discontents of different groups within the population, rural, urban, were fused together by this powerful force of nationalism. So they are very concerned the same thing could happen to the communist dynasty. Mm -hmm. and, and when, as, as, national, as you describe nationalism in the book, it's as if it, it's, it's, it's a fire that they have lit themselves in, in, in the past. And, and in this, this era they're in now, it's not clear that they can actually control it. Is, 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 is that their situation? You know, that, that it will, it will uh, rage out of control on a particular international issue? Well, they're particularly concerned about Japan and Taiwan issues, but mm -hmm. you're right. Uh, you know, I don't want to uh, imply that the nationalism is intensifying in China and anti-foreign nationalism mm -hmm. is intensifying in China because the Chinese people are all brainwashed. Mm -hmm. You know, some of this is just the spontaneous result mm -hmm. of the revival of Chinese power after what they call the 150 years of humiliation. That uh, is the, the foreigners occupying the country, making war. Being the, weak. Yeah, yeah. And divided and internationally sidelined and pressured by external power. So um, nationalism was going to rise no matter what. Mm -hmm. But then former President Jiang Zemin, who came into office right after Tiananmen, this close call, he was desperate to find a way to mobilize popular support for the Communist Party after Tiananmen. Nobody believes in communism anymore, mm -hmm. so he turned to nationalism as the basis for legitimacy and uh, uh, he launched this patriotic education campaign and did through textbooks and movies and other propaganda kind of stir up nationalism. So he reinforced this mm -hmm. spontaneous increase in nationalism and now it's come back to bite them. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, I, I guess that as we're now seeing that another uh, factor that they have to deal with is the availability of technology, mm -hmm. things like cell phones, the web, which are being censored, but there's a limit to how much censoring you can do. They, they actually become part of this dynamic, and at the same time you're building a, a middle class that is reading more and so on. So, right. so they, they, the, the, the information is something they're 
losing control of in a, in a way that they're having to deal with in a, in a very mm -hmm. serious way. Talk a little about that. Yes, I mean, I, I think it's very important, this information revolution in China. And I, in fact, I devote a whole chapter to the growth of the commercial media and the internet. Uh, I think it's important because people do have access to so much more information than they ever did before. And as a result, the leaders can't keep secret mm -hmm. from and hidden from the people what's, what the politicians in Japan or Taiwan or Washington mm -hmm. are saying, even though it might uh, stimulate a uh, nationalist response, it might make people angry. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they can't keep it hidden from people, nor can they keep hidden some uh, protest or disaster that occurs in one part of the country from people learning about it in another part of, co of the country. And you're right, there is censorship. Mm -hmm. You know, the coming of the internet has not caused the end of the communist regime. Mm -hmm. You know, there were some internet optimists who thought this was the magic bullet, it was going to change everything. Censorship is actually pretty effective still, but it's not 100% airtight. Mm -hmm. So there is definitely more information that people are learning, more news about what's going on in their own country and outside. And, and the, the, the control of information in the old days was just one of the central pillars of power. I mean, That's right. you, you could essentially say something and that was the word because the country was insulated from the outside in a way. It's that like North Korea. Yeah. Although even North Korea and the north of North Korea, they're getting information now. But in the past, it was, you know, China was more like North Korea is today. Mm -hmm. Now, the other, the other element of control in, that has been the military, really, mm -hmm. and military capabilities, as you point out, are increasing. With wealth comes the ability to acquire uh, more sophisticated uh, uh, weaponry mm -hmm. uh, and then to, to have a strategy uh, to use it. How, how does that uh, pillar of power come to, to become a double-edged sword, or does it? Well, uh, you know, the military has received double-digit annual increases in their budget since Tiananmen. And when Americans look at this and we think China's getting ready to make war on us, uh, of course the gap between our capabilities and China's capabilities remains huge. Mm -hmm. You know, America is really the world's uh, military superpower. but. China doesn't have to be our military equal in order to present problems for us. So why is China modernizing the military this way? And I argue it's, uh, it's domestic politics as well as or more than international threats that uh, can explain why China is developing its military this way. Because China's insecure leaders have to keep the military loyal. Mm -hmm. You know, they learned from Tiananmen from 1989 that if you have massive social protest and the leadership splits over what to do about it, the last backstop of mm -hmm. power is the military and the military has to remain loyal. So these double digit increases in the military budget are an effort to basically buy the support of the military. And Hu Jintao spends a lot of time cultivating relations with the generals, making sure they remain loyal, not just to the party, mm -hmm. but to him personally. Mm -hmm. and, and this is an important point because the, the fear is of a divided leadership. And the concrete form you suggest that that would take is that some, there's some, some, some item in this pressure cooker begins to boil over. And in the struggle for power within the party, right. one faction could seize on that and embrace it if everybody isn't moving forward together. And, and that's the real... Yeah, in a domestic crisis. Well, first of all, it's just very hard. There's normal competition mm -hmm. for power as there is in every political system. But, you know, in a communist political system, it's not as rule-bound, as institutionalized. 
So how do you handle succession? How do you handle the choice, who gets promoted to be the number one leader, the number two and the number three leader? It's not easy for them to manage that and keep it hidden from people. You know, if people know that mm -hmm. there are splits in the leadership, then that encourages them to come out and protest and demonstrate because they feel that they may be able to do it safely. Mm -hmm. They won't be yanked off by the police and punished for demonstrating. So in, this, in the context of this information revolution, how do you prevent leaks about leadership competition? There are a lot of leaks in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. Hong Kong media. And I feel that it's only a matter of time before you get to see that kind of information on the internet. There's a lot of rumors now. Mm -hmm. But someday those rumors are going to start appearing on the internet. And that'll be very hard to manage. You're suggesting that there are all of these structural changes mm -hmm. through uh, uh, interfacing with the international economy, with the new technologies mm -hmm. that, that are creating these pressures right. that uh, it, it ultimately it's going to become more and more difficult to contain them domestically mm -hmm. without bringing either more democracy to the system mm -hmm. or, as we'll talk about in a minute, translating these domestic pressures into some sort of negative international policy. Right, and I'm not arguing that China is on the brink of collapse right, tomorrow. Right, yeah, and right. in fact, I'm pretty amazed at how resilient the party has been in a lot of ways. Like, for example, uh, recruiting college students. Mm -hmm. You know, here you have a market economy, and yet it's still very much in the interests of the best and the brightest to join the Communist Party. Now that's interesting. It's kind of a puzzle. Mm -hmm. I don't think I completely understand mm -hmm. uh, why someone who's going to work in a joint venture or a foreign firm, why should they still think that it's helpful to them to be a Communist Party member? I mean, it's certainly not because they have such great, uh, you know, uh, enthusiasm for political study mm -hmm. or for the goals of communism but they still join the party. So there's, there's a lot of resilience in the system. They have adapted mm -hmm. surprisingly well, but there are still these fault lines mm -hmm. and that I think you know, ultimately will not be possible to manage without some major political change. What, what about the problem of corruption? That is that, yeah, that families a, uh, close to the leadership yeah. uh, benefit quite a bit economically. I mean, mm -hmm. is that an issue that they're addressing or are they just show, not show trials, but show cases, so to speak, where they identify uh, somebody who's been uh, seriously inadequate in their job or have, have, have benefited personally f in a financial way? Yes, I mean, just this last week, uh, President Hu Jintao called the entire Central Committee, all the leaders of the provinces, the entire Chinese political elite into a major meeting, and this is in advance of the party congress, the important party congress coming up in the fall, to give them a speech about we've really got to get a handle on corruption, was mm -hmm. the main focus of it. And also to let people know he has no intention of carrying out real democratic reform. I mean, he said that by embracing democracy mm -hmm. in name, but it's pretty clear that they're actually uh, too afraid because they don't know what the consequences will be to even introduce some gradual uh, democratic competition in the system. So uh, this corruption is uh, a major problem and you know China now is a, is a more unequal society. Mm -hmm. The wealth gap is bigger than it is in the United States. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of discussion uh, in party meetings and in the media about the problem. They call it polarization. The reason they're so worried about it, it, and they think it's potentially politically explosive, is because everybody believes that the wealthy people got their money 
not mm -hmm. through ingenuity and, and hard work, but through official connections and official corruption. And that is really uh, very dangerous. You know, every now and then, a, uh, some big shot in a BMW hits a poor peddler mm -hmm. in a Chinese city, and the crowd mm -hmm. goes wild, start attacking the police, you know, violent reaction because of the symbolism of having this big shot mm -hmm. act like they don't care about the poor. Mm -hmm. So Chinese leaders today are trying to show they care about the poor. Um, they um, go down to the countryside and they go on television and show their great sympathy for the poor, but they are really worried about this wealth gap because it's tied up with the corruption issue. Mm -hmm. you, you talk about the, the failure of provision of public goods, and in particular mm -hmm. the, the environment. And there was oh, some yeah. figure that you gave of the top 20 most mm -hmm. polluted cities, something like 16 or so, or so in, are, China. Are in China. Yeah, I mean, it is uh, yeah. just one big environmental mm -hmm. uh, disaster. And why has this happened? It's because the party leaders have been had this single-minded focus on keeping up the growth rates because mm -hmm. growth makes jobs mm -hmm. and prevents massive uh, unemployment and unrest from urban labor which is politically very threatening mm -hmm. so they're focused on growth but meanwhile nobody's paying attention mm -hmm. to the water the air Mm -hmm. Health is very much effective. The costs of this, estimates of the economic costs are huge. The human costs are used, huge. And now you have demonstrations that are starting in reaction to these environmental disasters. So it's becoming a political threat to the leadership and they're very worried about it and trying to figure out what to do about it. And, and let's, let's talk about this dynamic because what, what, this this problem mm -hmm. it gets tied up with the information revolution so suddenly you have a protest in one small town in in a in a particular mm -hmm. province and information about that pro uh, protest can go national in a way right. through the the kind of underground media cell phones websites and so on even as the party officials are censoring it as 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 one website opens and is closed and another one right. emerges that's right. So it inspires people in other localities that have similar problems to feel mm -hmm. like, well, we can do this too. Mm -hmm. So it can spread. Mm -hmm. Now, so far, there isn't that much of that. Most, prote most protest activity in China is still pretty small scale and localized. But the party leaders uh, are very worried about this because it, there are, have been some instances in which it has spread mm -hmm. through the information, as you say. Mm -hmm. Now, now uh, uh, what you, you point out two things as we move into foreign relations. Mm -hmm. One is a concern that some of this uh, uh, set of difficulties at home could spill over into the international re, re, uh, into international relations because they don't have an outlet within the domestic system, and 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 uh, so there there are, there are tendencies at work that could spill over in, into a, a different realm as the leaders attempt to deal with it, and and you especially talk about relations about. Uh, relations with Taiwan, mm -hmm. relations with Japan, and, mm -hmm. and then also the United States. Talk a little right. about that. Well, you know, uh, if you're feeling anxious about your domestic support, uh, one of the best things you can do to rally support for yourself is to find a foreign threat. Mm -hmm. You know, this is in political we, we're science. We're to do that too. <laughs> well, in, yeah, and people, years. you know, the, they talk about the wag the dog. Yeah idea, which is to actually uh, create, go to war mm -hmm. in order to divert attention from domestic problems. I'm actually, I think that's a very small risk in China. Mm -hmm. But I worry 
that there could be some international crisis or provocation and that China's leaders would react by making threats in order to look tough and strong domestically and then feel they can't back down from it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not arguing so much the wag mm -hmm. the dog uh, scenario as uh, it would be reactive. Mm -hmm. But it could be very, very dangerous. Now, I saw this very vividly in this uh, terrible experience I had when I was in government in 1999 when the U.S. bombed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade mm -hmm. by mistake. This was during the, the Bosnia War, or the That's Kosovo right. War. The right, it was yeah. part of the NATO mm -hmm. action. And, uh, you know, I got this phone call saying, uh, you know, the, U the Chinese embassy in Belgrade has been struck and appears to have been an American bomber and uh, several people were killed th three people yeah. were killed 20 were injured and it turned out that in fact we had it wasn't collateral damage or a stray fragment we targeted this building mistaking it for a yugoslav military facility so the chinese reaction to this even though i mean my you know i describe this in the book mm -hmm. um you know, I knew we had to apologize profusely because if we didn't show how terribly sorry we were, I knew the Chinese would never let us forget it, mm -hmm. just as they've never let the Japanese forget their failure to apologize adequately for their occupation of China brutal brutality during World War II when they occupied China. But so we did all these things to show how sorry we were. The president apologized, uh, or he tried to. Mm -hmm. You know, Jiang Zemin wouldn't take his phone call. Mm -hmm. Finally, he did a few days later. He apologized on television. We paid compensation. But nevertheless, there were these demonstrations against the U.S. Embassy and consulates in other cities, and the party facilitated that. Mm -hmm. They, first of all, they told people it was an intentional act mm -hmm. on the part of the United States. Mm -hmm. And secondly, they provided buses, you know, for the students, mostly students, to go to the embassy and to the consulates. And it was obvious why this had happened, and I discussed this in the book. And basically, the leaders were worried that if the students didn't go after the Americans, they would come after them mm -hmm. for being so weak that you would allow this humiliation of, of uh, Americans feeling they could attack the Chinese embassy. So that was quite a bitter lesson for me, and I saw other examples of that in which the leaders were willing to even confront the United States, mm -hmm. despite our tremendous military power, risk a confrontation with the United States in order to protect their skins domestically. Mm -hmm. Now, you quote uh, Deng Xiaoping, uh, uh, who uh, was the preeminent leader uh, uh, before uh, and made, yeah, before yes, and and you say he he said hide our capacities and bide our time, but also get things done. Mm -hmm. Th this is part of a general sense that the Chinese have of wanting to be pragmatic, you know, in their dealings with the world, uh, build up good relations in the region they're in, yeah. and and because they are on this treadmill, as you said earlier, they 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 really need this seven to eight percent growth every year to keep having new jobs for the people right. who are moving to the city. Yeah, and actually, so this is a positive thing. Yeah, you yeah. know, the the Chinese now describe themselves as a responsible power, mm -hmm. which I find really interesting given that that phrase was phrase that we put in the speeches of President Clinton and mm -hmm. other of our senior officials back in the 90s and the Chinese just adopted yeah. the phrase to describe themselves. Um, but I think it's credible because it is motivated, mm -hmm. as you point out, by their own domestic uh, power considerations. They mm -hmm. want to keep, they want to prevent any conflicts, especially with the United States, mm -hmm. that could 
uh, interrupt this economic growth and maintaining power domestically. So by and large, Chinese foreign policy has become increasingly pragmatic. Mm -hmm. And that's great. We can handle that. Other countries are feeling reassured, although if you, I don't know if you noticed, there's just a new uh, Pew study. Mm -hmm. okay. It's yes. interesting because despite all of this pragmatic Chinese foreign policy, mm -hmm. people have more apprehensions about China. You know, in the United States. Not just yeah, the United States, States. Europe oh, all and over, other... All, all over. Yeah. Yes, all over. Well, they're rising power. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So, um, but it helps you understand why the Chinese are working so hard to persuade people they have friendly intentions because they understand mm -hmm. that their rise provokes this misperception, mm -hmm. as they would put it, that they're a threat because mm -hmm. they don't think they are. Now, one of the places that we, we, we can see by looking at these, what's going on in China is their need for oil. And so one of the mm -hmm. issues that's going to be out there is will their need for oil uh, drive them to relations with countries such as the Sudan, right. uh, which would then go about against our interests and possibly a global interest in kind of human rights policies and mm -hmm. so on. How, how do you think that will play out in the sense, will, will the Chinese be pragmatic in this area also? I mean, they, they have to get the oil. They, right. they need these relations. Talk a little about that. Yes, well, you know, just in the last year or so, I think people are paying a lot of attention to the fact that the Chinese have gone out to Latin America, to Africa, to the Middle East, to get energy and other mineral resources to feed this, you know, rapidly growing economy. They don't have enough domestically. They have to get it somewhere. And they've gone to a number of countries that we don't want to deal with because they have bad governments. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but from their standpoint, they've got, they feel that they need to invest in these resources and get them from somewhere. And all the good countries have kind of been sewn up by the Western oil companies. So they feel that they don't have that much choice. Uh, by the way, India is doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So um, now they find themselves confronted by this political dilemma because everybody's pointing fingers and blaming them for dealing with people like Bashir in the Sudan, uh, Chavez in Venezuela, although they're probably going to be leery of doing that as just as everyone is now. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, so they have to figure out how to manage this. They don't want to provoke conflict mm -hmm. with other countries, but on the other hand, they need to get the resources. And I think you see mm -hmm. that their approach to problems like the Sudan is becoming more pragmatic. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk a, lot, uh, a little about the United States now and, mm -hmm. and Chinese relations. Since you were in government, the, 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 uh, the, there is a much greater degree of codependency now as a result right. of the, the state of the American economy. Uh, and let me hear pull out some of the statistics uh, that you quote in your book. The U.S. is China's largest overseas market and second largest source of its foreign direct investment on a cumulative basis. Positive, 60,000 Chinese students study in the U.S. every year. But we, the Chinese are now loaning us $250 billion a year. Our trade deficit with them is approximately $200 billion. They have $1 trillion in reserves, and 70 to 80 percent of that is in uh, U.S. government bonds. So, so there is codependency <laughs> underlined here, and it, it really uh, affects uh, what uh, we can ask of them, although we continue to ask a lot. So talk a little about that. I mean, our vulnerability now as these two countries move forward you know, into the future. Yeah, I mean, basically, we have an interest, just as China's leaders have an interest, that in the Chinese economy mm -hmm. continuing to grow and, made, and to be stable there. I mean, a domestic crisis in China, a crash in China, would mm -hmm. not be good for the United States. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, just as China, you know, Zhu Rongji, the former premier, he gave a speech in the around 2000 and at a university, and students said, "What is the biggest threat to China in U.S.-China relations?" And they said, um, "A downturn in the U.S. economy." Mm -hmm. So they have an interest in our economy mm -hmm. remaining strong. Mm -hmm. You know, this bilateral trade deficit is really, uh, you know, so conspicuous. It's the biggest trade gap that we've ever had with any country, much bigger now than any we ever had with Japan. And somehow it looks like China is exploiting us. Mm -hmm. um, but it's actually... Uh, much more complicated than that. I mean, one of the things people say is that the competition from China is destroying American jobs. Well, this is the whole outsourcing issue. The fact of the matter is that the manufacturing sector in the United States has been shrinking way before actually yeah. China was a factor. Mm -hmm. And it's just a structural change in the U.S. economy. Uh, the second thing is the trade gap. Actually, our trade balance with Asia mm -hmm. has remained roughly the same for a long period of time. What's happening is that Japanese companies, South Korean companies, Southeast Asian companies, Taiwanese companies, and American companies are using China as a production base. So most of those exports from China to the United States are actually foreign companies. So our trade balance with Taiwan or South Korea or Japan has, um, you know, the trade gap has shrunk, mm -hmm. but the trade gap with China has gotten bigger. Mm -hmm. So actually, the deficit is very explicable, mm -hmm. and I try to make it simple so that people can understand. And, it. and also, you know, parts of the American economy are extracting a lot of wealth from China in the sense that the, the percentage of, of the, the, the uh, money that's going to American companies is rather large. I think you used the example of the Barbie doll. Uh, that's right. we, uh, 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 namely, a, a big percentage of that, uh, of, of that income is going to American companies, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. But the thing we have to realize is over time, mm -hmm. more a uh, larger and larger share of those exports is going to be Chinese companies mm -hmm. because they are upgrading their technologies. Mm -hmm. They're moving up from uh, kind of labor intensive light manufacturing to more technology goods, electronics. And it's going to be Chinese companies. So mm -hmm. that's a trend that we should expect. And you know, and then I'll tell you when we're going to have real trouble mm -hmm. is that the Chinese automobile industry. Mm -hmm. China is going to start exporting automobiles mm -hmm. to Europe and the United States. So it's going to be more like those trade conflicts we had with Japan because we're going to be head on head competing mm -hmm. in the future. Mm -hmm. and, and you know when one reads the newspaper the Secretary of the Treasury goes to China, uh, uh, members of the, of the Congress go to, con uh, to China to demand that there's a revaluation. And you point out that, you know, coming back to this, their domestic concerns, mm -hmm. uh, that they don't want the currency to float because import pressure on the prices of agricultural goods could spark peasant rebellion. A drop in manufacturing mm -hmm. exports would increase unemployment, and the pressure on the shaky financial system could cause a mass run on, on the banks. So this is really complicated. For them, it's very complicated. Yeah. And of course, when we make a lot of noise about uh, raising the value of their currency and say they're manipulating their currency, um, then that foreign pressure makes it very hard mm -hmm. for Chinese leaders to do what we're asking because domestically they'll look weak. And then they don't know. I've, t I've done a lot of talking to people, uh, senior economic and financial officials in China they actually don't know what the consequences will be. They're worried about it. They are worried that the farmers will mm -hmm. be put under real pressure and that you'll, they'll get more demonstrations in the countryside as well as the city. So, you know, as I point out, keeping power at home is the most important thing. And, you know, which is true 
frankly, in every country, but in most, in democracies, it's just a matter of winning the next election. Mm -hmm. But in China, it's maintaining Communist Party rule. Mm -hmm. So, so you look. You were. Let me. By the way, let me show your book again. Uh, China. <laughs> nice fragile. cover. I like the yeah, cover. Yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful cover, actually. Uh, uh, so, so let's go back to this role that you had in Washington, and then the purpose of your book. Because what uh -huh. you really want to do here is is make people, policymakers, the public, sensitive to these constraints on China, even as, you know, you, you, you point out the, the problems in, in some of uh, 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 China's own domestic situation. So, so uh, is that a fair? Yeah. Yes, but I, I want to make clear that it doesn't mean, well, let's be gentle with China. Right, no, that's what I want, yeah, so talk let's a little. Let's be smart. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Let's be smart. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, because, you know, Madeleine Albright, taught me, you can never get anywhere di diplomatically unless you can put yourself in the shoes of that other guy sitting across from the table mm -hmm. from you. So I think we need to put ourselves in the place of China's leaders and then be smart about our policy. So first of all, we need to realize that everything we say and do is going to resonate inside mm -hmm. Chinese domestic politics. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I do think we need to remain strong. Not economically strong, of course, because we're going to need to compete effectively, but also militarily strong. Because when China's leaders are in a crisis regarding Taiwan or re regarding Japan, and they're feeling a lot of domestic pressure to make a threat that they can't back down from, say, mm -hmm. I want them to look out across the Pacific uh, and see a strong American military. So they know that they can't act out in order to look strong at home, that there is real risk mm -hmm. to provoking the United States. But so I care about being strong, but what I advise against is chest thumping. Mm -hmm. Or building up our, our alliance with uh, the Japanese military. Yeah, here's where I do, you know, basically I think the Bush administration has not done a bad job. Mm -hmm. I'm a Democrat, but I'm not very critical mm -hmm. of the Bush administration in this respect, in mm -hmm. its policy toward China. But I think that they've, uh, we've gone a little overboard in encouraging Japan to build up its military capabilities and uh, strengthening our military alliance with Japan in a very vocal, chest-thumping kind of way. Now, I, I'm in favor of a strong Japan, mm -hmm. but I don't think if you throw it in the face of China's leaders and Chinese public, this we didn't have much chance today to talk about this anti-Japanese nationalism, but it's the most virulent mm -hmm force in China. And that's so. a result of history, and it's a result of nationalism at home, and, and so on. And this patriotic education yeah. campaign, and the yeah. textbooks. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, uh, I'm really unhappy about mm -hmm. Chinese textbooks. Chinese complain about the Japanese textbooks. Mm -hmm. Chinese textbooks, especially in regard to how they depict Japan, they have very little on post-war Japan. Mm -hmm. It's all about terrible wartime oppression and how Japan stole Taiwan and all this stuff. So uh, anti-Japanese sentiment is very widespread. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, let, well, unfortunately, the train has probably left the station and there's so much in Japan, there is a lot of support for building up Japanese military power mm -hmm. now. And so it, uh, but I don't think the United States should be encouraging it in this same kind of um, uh, loud mm -hmm. way as we have during the Bush administration. This effort, uh, this book is an effort to, to build a dialogue at, at a, on a new level between the, the U.S. And, and, and China, sort of creating 
a situation where uh, at least the American side understands China better. If, if you stand between the two countries, what, what advice would you, one, one piece of thing, advice that you think is very important for the Chinese in, in yeah. terms of changing their behavior and also for the United States, what do you think, is, is there a piece of advice for the United States that you have? Well, um, for China, yes, I do give advice to the Chinese mm -hmm. leaders, too. I'm very free with my advice. <laughs> I'll give it to Washington. I'll give it to Beijing. And uh, well, I Joe, hope the Chinese leaders will read it, too. Zhou Enlai uh, said maybe you would be the next president, uh, uh, a future president. <laughs> yes. Wow. <well, laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, I think one thing they should do is definitely try to uh, cool off this anti-Japanese nationalism. It's tricky because mm -hmm. if they, any step they make, they will be criticized at home mm -hmm. for being too soft on Japan. But let's at least educate future generations to have a more balanced view of Japan. Let's revise the textbooks. Let's ce stop celebrating annually mm -hmm. these battles in which uh, China was humiliated by Japanese soldiers. Uh, you know, I think you could, you could do quite a lot mm -hmm. to try to reduce this kind of anti-Japanese nationalism. You know, every time I say this on a blog or something, Chinese come after me. Mm -hmm. um, and not, by the way, I'm not blaming it entirely on the actions of the Chinese government because plenty of Chinese who live outside China mm -hmm. feel much the same, but not quite as intensely as people living in China. Um, the other thing I'm suggesting to China is um, I think they should give private business people mm -hmm. and provincial officials more of a voice in foreign policy. One thing that worries me is that decisions about war and peace are being made primarily by party leaders and the military. We need some counterweight there of people who really want to maintain the peace. What about the United States? Any advice for the United States other than read your book? <laughs> well, no, I, I uh, as I mentioned, remember uh, American politicians as they're trying to uh, win points at home for looking tough on China, right? China is a good foil mm -hmm. because we expect our leaders to look tough and strong in the face of outside threats, just as Chinese expect their leaders to do because we're both big powers. Mm -hmm. Actually, often I'm aware of how much we in China are alike <laughs> in this respect. So politicians should be cautious though they need to be statesmen as well as politicians and recognize that taking cheap shots at China and trying to just rhetorically go after China is going to resonate within Chinese. Chinese folks are going to know about it because they have the information now. And that forces Chinese leaders to react in, and it's counterproductive. Mm. So don't chest thump, but remain strong. Susan, on, on that hopeful note, if, if, if both sides follow your advice, let me show your book one more time. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a, an excellent uh, sort of background for people who want to keep informed uh, uh, about uh, this very important relationship uh, that we have with, with China. And, and also, not, not just for scholars, basically. We're talking about the general public and policymakers. Oh, fine. yeah. Well, I wrote this for, um, for the general audience, and it was great to write and tell stories and uh, eliminate all that social science jargon. So what makes me happiest is when I get a review about how readable it is. Yes, and that it definitely is. So thank, thank you it. very much for coming back to Berkeley and, and talking about your book. Thanks. I enjoyed it, Harry. Thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.